Hello everyone, today we're going to discuss the efficacy of vaccines and examine the claims made by anti-vaxxers, so let's jump right in. <laughs> Before I go into this, first let me say this to those who are watching. If you are hesitant to get vaccinated, I hear you. It's natural to end up being concerned after hearing claims about the danger of vaccines which are perpetually circulating through the internet. I understand why this can make you feel scared about the well-being of yourself and your loved ones. This is also why we need to pause for a moment, be careful before we believe these claims, and keep in mind where these claims are coming from. We need to examine these claims to see if they check out before we accept them. Even if you don't agree with me at the end of the video, that's up to you. So let's take a moment to take a deep breath. We can get through this together. This video was spurred into existence by podcaster and former MMA fighter Joe Rogan hosting a well-known and very prominent anti-vaxxer named Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And no, before anyone makes the argument that it isn't fair to label RFK Jr. as an anti-vaxxer since he is not against all vaccines, it's a plain fact that his career for almost two decades now has consisted of echoing the main anti-vaccine claims, such as the claim that they cause autism. Last year, the Center for Countering Digital Hate analyzed a sample of anti-vaccine content on social media. This sample consisted of posts that were shared 800,000 times on Facebook and Twitter from February 1st to March 16th in 2021. They found that 65% of this anti-vaccine content originated from just 12 individuals, which includes RFK Jr. This isn't a coincidence. Not only that, during this recent Joe Rogan podcast, RFK Jr. also made some pretty wacky claims about what Wi-Fi does to you, such as causing cancer and opening up the blood-brain barrier. Don't take my word for it. Here it is. Wi-Fi radi uh, radiation is a lot worse than people think it is, but, you know, I don't think... How so? Well, Wi-Fi radiation is... Uh, it does all kinds of bad things, including causing cancer. Wi-Fi radiation causes yeah, cancer. Yeah, from your cell phone. I mean, there's cell phone tuner, tumors. You know that. I mean, I'm representing hundreds of people who have cell phone tumors behind the ear. It's always on the ear that you favor with your cell phone. Oh, um, and you know we have the science. So if anybody lets us in front of a jury, they, it will be over. You know, we, so what is, what is the number? Because a lot of people use There's a phones. lot of people with it. They're glioblastomas. That's the kind of cancers that they get. But cancer's not the worst thing. They also, you know, it opens up, Wi-Fi radiation opens up your blood-brain barrier. And so all these toxins that are in your body can now go into your brain. How does Wi-Fi radiation open up your blood-brain barrier? Yeah, now you're going beyond my, uh, my okay. expertise. I'm RFK Jr. goes on to say that he and his organization, the Children's Health Defense, sued the Food and Drug Administration relating to this issue, and even claiming that he won the case. A small problem with this story is that it's simply a lie. All the lawsuits his organization has filed against the FDA, Facebook, Rutgers, Reuters, and the BBC, among others, involving mandatory vaccines and public vaccine information, have been dismissed outdoing even creationists who usually don't claim that they have won lawsuits they didn't. His organization sued the FDA on August 31st, 2021 for, quote, failing to carry out its mission, close quote, for approving COVID-19 vaccines for children. The court found that his organization lacked standing and the case was dismissed. A number of other groups have alleged that cell phones cause brain cancer and sued AT&T, Motorola, and other telecommunication companies on those grounds. However, these cases have, without fail, been dismissed for lack of evidence. And let's talk about that evidence for a moment. It is a perfectly valid question to ask whether or not cell phones cause cancer. What isn't valid, though, is stating that cell phones definitively do cause cancer or that there are thousands of studies supporting this link. 
they don't, and there aren't. Quite the opposite. First, do cell phones emit any sort of radiation? Yes, radio waves. For many decades, researchers have been testing whether low-energy radio waves, like the ones from cell phones, cause any sort of harm to humans, and the conclusion has been that no statistically significant effects have been found. However, a number of studies have claimed to link cell phone usage with cancers like glioblastoma. Problematically, many of these studies that claim to show a link between cell phone use and cancer or some other malady generate non-reproducible results, as discussed by the 2022 paper Controversy in Electromagnetic Safety. Another problem is that some studies in favor of the association claim to find evidence for non-thermal radiation, i.e. radio waves producing maladies, but their experimental design provides no way to rule out thermal radiation, i.e. heat. This was the case for the 2003 paper, Exposure of Human Peripheral Blood Lymphocytes to Electromagnetic Fields Associated with Cellular Phones Leads to Chromosomal Instability. Even though an unaffiliated researcher demonstrated to the experimenters that thermal radiation was in fact causing the chromosomal instability, the paper had already been published in a reputable journal. Furthermore, large-scale studies on humans like the UK Million Women study have documented no statistically significant increase in the prevalence of cancers associated with cell phones. And one should predict that if cell phones are associated with cancer, then the incidence of cell phone-caused cancers, like glioblastoma, should skyrocket with the spread of cell phones. Yet, numerous long-term studies on the incidence of such cancers have shown no correlation with cell phone usage or even a statistically significant increase in the cancer's occurrences. And notably, there is no explanation for how radio waves could directly cause cancer. Without a testable, causal mechanism, there is no way to verify that causation is being studied rather than simply correlation. It is for these reasons that the National Institute of Health, the World Health Organization, the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, and the Food and Drug Administration all deny any evidence-based association between cell phones and cancer. So no, there is no mechanistic explanation for how the low-energy radio waves emitted by cell phones could cause cancer, nor how they could open the blood-brain barrier. RFK Jr.'s assertions have no basis in reality, but this isn't the first time he has publicly asserted fiction as fact. Back in 2005, RFK Jr. alleged that the mercury-based vaccine preservative thimerosal was linked to autism. Though a few studies have claimed to detect a link between thimerosal and autism, the overwhelming consensus of medical professionals is that there is no causal link between the two, as indicated by the 2022 review, The Myth of Vaccination and Autism Spectrum. The belief that vaccines are linked to autism soared in popularity following a now-discredited study published in the British medical journal The Lancet, led by Andrew Wakefield. Wakefield claimed that the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine caused a digestive tract pathology that resulted in autism. His entire sample size was only 12 children, none of which displayed the symptoms Wakefield alleged. See H. Bomber Guy's excellent video on the subject. Nevertheless, thimerosal was largely removed from childhood vaccines across the U.S. in 2001, except for some but not all of the flu vaccines. It's also the case that mercury levels in the blood of Americans have decreased from 2005 to 2012, according to the data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Yet, autism rates continued to rise anyway, more likely because we got better at diagnosing autism. In a report from the National Health Statistic, they analyzed the prevalence of parent-reported ASD among children aged 6 to 17. They found that the rate was 2% between 2011 to 2012, which is an increase from 1.16% back in 2007. They noted this increase was greatest for boys and adolescents aged 14 to 17, even though symptoms of autism are often recognizable at the age of 2 to 5. This suggests that many of the new autism diagnoses were among those who already had autism for many years, but weren't recognized as such until later in life. 
This is further corroborated by the fact that school-aged children diagnosed in or after 2008 were more likely to have milder forms of ASD with symptoms that are more subtle compared to those diagnosed on or before 2007. This is why the report comes to the conclusion that, quote, much of the prevalence increased from 2007 to 2011 to 2012 for school-aged children was the result of diagnoses of children with previously unrecognized ASD, close quote. But this hasn't stopped RFK Jr. from continuing to make false statements about thimerosal and mercury. He also did this in the Joe Rogan podcast when he recounts a conversation he had with Dr. Paul A. Offit, who co-invented the rotavirus vaccine Rotatech. The rotavirus easily infects infants and young children, which may cause fever, abdominal pain, vomiting, and severe diarrhea, leading to dehydration. Rotavirus vaccines have saved the lives of tens of thousands of children under the age of five. So, here's the clip. And when I talked to him, I caught him in a lie. So what was I, the lie? Well, I asked him this question. I said, why is it at CDC and, and every state um, regulator recommends that, um, that pregnant women do not eat tuna fish to avoid the mercury, but that CDC is recommending mercury-containing flu shots with huge bolus doses of mercury, I mean, massive doses, to pregnant women in every trimester of pregnancy. And he said, well, Bobby, there are there's two kinds of mercury. There's a good mercury and there's a bad mercury. That his argument was not with me, but it was with the periodic tables. The first thing that needs to be pointed out is that RFK Jr. clearly doesn't grasp the very basics of chemistry. The same atomic element can be found in different substances or compounds, but that doesn't mean those substances have the same properties. Take the smallest element hydrogen, for example. In the form of H2 or hydrogen gas, it will violently explode when ignited in the presence of oxygen, but that reaction produces H2O, which is water. Hence, the element hydrogen can have different properties depending on the chemical context. Regarding mercury, there are three general forms of mercury, elemental, inorganic, and organic. Elemental mercury is the iconic liquid metal that was used in old thermometers and barometers. This type of mercury tends to be dangerous, especially when inhaling the vapor. Inorganic mercury is any chemical compound that contains mercury, but without any carbon atoms. A good example of this is mercury sulfide, which constitutes the mineral cinnabar, a common source for mercury refining. This can also be toxic, but since inorganic mercury tends to be solid and locked up in the Earth's crust, it's mostly of no concern. The particularly dangerous type of mercury, the one we keep an eye on in seafood that RFK Jr. was referring to, is an organic form of mercury. Specifically, methyl mercury, which has one carbon atom. This is the most toxic form of mercury, and it bioaccumulates. It is produced naturally by microbes, but the prevalence of methyl mercury in the environment has also increased from human pollution, the burning of coal in particular. However, this is still different from mercury in thimerosal. When thimerosal is broken down in our bodies, the product is ethyl mercury, which has two carbon atoms. Ethyl mercury isn't as dangerous as the one carbon methyl mercury. It also doesn't have the same bioaccumulative properties as the latter. One carbon atom can make a lot of difference. Ethanol is two carbon atoms, which is otherwise known as ordinary alcohol present in our drinks. As long as you don't drink too much of it, you can have a good time. However, methanol consists of only one carbon atom, and it can blind or kill you even at amounts that would be modest for ethanol. Paul Offit was likely explaining this high school level chemistry to RFK Jr., but RFK Jr. just doesn't understand that different compounds have different properties. Or he simply refuses to understand it and continues to conflate methylmercury with ethylmercury while misrepresenting Paul Offit as if he were arguing against the periodic table. RFK Jr. has been known to twist the words of scientists he has spoken to in private in the past. For example, RFK Jr. talked to Laura Helmuth, an editor of Slate, to complain about an article they had written on him in 2013. 
During that conversation, he claimed several named scientists admitted to him in private that he is right about thimerosal being, quote, the most potent brain killer imaginable, close quote. However, when Laura Helmuth contacted one of these scientists, they said, quote, Kennedy completely misrepresented everything I said, close quote. Further, RFK Jr. has teamed up with other virulently anti-vaccine groups like Safe Minds, including Mark F. Blacksill, and Generation Rescue. RFK Jr. is by no means an impartial observer neutrally relaying the facts. He has an obvious bias, he distorts facts to fit his preformed narrative. But he isn't the only one. On the heels of the Rogan interview, conservative grifter Candace Owens twice tweeted a chart from the 2007 study, Historical Comparisons of Morbidity and Mortality for Vaccine Preventable Diseases in the United States. First, she says, quote, Virtually no one was dying of measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, tetanus in the United States. It's insane that parents don't know this and genuinely fear these diseases so much that they put their children at risk for cancer, seizures, lifelong mental impairment, autoimmune disorders, and sudden death, close quote. Then she said, quote, this chart kills me, only 601 cases of tetanus before the vaccines in the U.S., now every parent thinks their child is going to die from stepping on a rusty nail. Where did they get that idea? From Big Pharma ads, today one in 36 kids has autism, this insanity needs to stop. Close quote. What actually needs to stop are the problems with Candace's truly ignorant analysis. For starters, she mistakes smallpox for chickenpox when they're completely different diseases. Smallpox is caused by the variola virus, while chickenpox is caused by the varicella zoster virus. Second, the chart doesn't say 601 people died ever from tetanus. It says the peak number of deaths from tetanus occurred in 1948, when there were 601 deaths. The average number of deaths per year, according to the chart, is 472, meaning that almost 500 people died annually in the U.S. from tetanus. In fact, 2-3 to three million deaths were associated with measles globally each year, and about 5-10 to ten fold more with neurological squillae, including brain injuries and deafness. And, of course, Candace asserts a causal link between vaccines and autism, but also adds seizures, lifelong mental impairment, autoimmune disorders, and sudden death. Sudden death is a reference to another conspiracy theory pushed after the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine that blamed the sudden, allegedly mysterious deaths of young adults on the COVID-19 vaccine. A study published this year, however, found no link between cardiac arrest and the vaccine. Sudden Death may also be a subtle reference to that film called Died Suddenly, which is so bad that even some prominent anti-vaxxers have turned against it. Mike Adams, the self-named Health Ranger, said that this film was, quote, exposed for more misrepresentations each day, and, close quote, and questioned whether the filmmakers, quote, even bothered to fact-check any of these clips, close quote. You have no idea how weird this is coming from Mike Adams, who runs the site Natural News, which has been put at the number one spot of Brian Dunning's top 10 worst anti-science websites. Answers in Genesis is at number 5, by the way. There are also some on the anti-vax site, the COVID blog, who claim that the only logical explanation for why the film died suddenly contains so many falsehoods is that the filmmakers are actually controlled opposition who made this film deliberately awful in order to make the anti-vaccine movement look bad. Anyway, going over the film itself would make this video way too long. I will refer to an excellent takedown by Dr. Wilson in the description. He has also recently uploaded a thorough takedown of Joe Rogan's podcast with RFK Jr. Seriously, go subscribe to him if you haven't. Rebecca Watson also made a recent video covering the absolutely unhinged aftermath of this debacle with RFK Jr. and Joe Rogan, involving people receiving harassment from anti-vaxxers, particularly Professor Peter Hotez, after refusing, rightfully I might add, 
to debate RFK Jr. on Joe Rogan's podcast. Finally, on Candace's tweet, it should be noted that the abstract of the paper says, quote, a greater than 92% decline in cases and a 99% or greater decline in deaths due to diseases prevented by vaccines recommended before 1980 were shown for diphtheria, mumps, pertussis, and tetanus, close quote. So vaccines do work, and the very paper she cited said so, but she offered no evidence that they generally cause autism, seizures, or other alleged effects. Furthermore, under-vaccination has resulted in resurgences of measles and other vaccine-preventable diseases. That should be alarming to anyone. To name other studies regarding the life-saving value of vaccines and the impact of vaccine hesitancy on the public, Dr. Lawrence D. Frankel assesses the global burden of vaccine-preventable diseases among children under the age of 5. This report says that 5.3 million children under the age of 5 died from all causes in the year of 2018. Among them, 700,000 died of vaccine-preventable diseases. The vast majority of these children lived in low- and middle-income countries. The lack of access to vaccines in different parts of the world is a real problem that we are still struggling with today. This inequity is largely the result of the fact that vaccines are generally controlled by a for-profit pharmaceutical industry, despite the fact that the R&D of vaccines has been supported by billions of dollars of public funding. That's inexcusable. Even though I disagree with them on the use of vaccines themselves, the anti-vaxxers do have a point when they complain about Big Pharma. Regarding COVID vaccines specifically, a report by Imperial College London published in 2021 and a paper published in Nature in 2022 concludes that the mortality rate of COVID-19 could have been up to eight times higher in countries with high vaccine hesitancy compared to an ideal vaccination uptake if non-pharmaceutical intervention was taken into account. To put some actual numbers to this, the paper Global Impact of the First Year of COVID-19 Vaccination, a Mathematical Modeling Study, finds that between 13.7 and 15.9 million lives were saved from December 8, 2020 to December 8, 2021. Their estimate rose to between 19.1 and 20.4 million lives saved when they used the excess deaths as an estimate of the true extent of the pandemic, which would represent a reduction of 63% from a total of 31.4 million deaths. However, the paper also reports that an additional 45%, representing 42 to 49 million deaths, could have been averted in low-income countries if the 20% vaccination coverage target had been met in each of these countries, and an additional 111% of deaths could have been averted if the 40% vaccination coverage target set by WHO was met by each country. There are plenty of other papers out there that all make similar conclusions. To close this video, I want to make an impassioned plea to my viewers who may be genuinely concerned regarding vaccines. I understand that science can be complicated and it can feel like other people are making decisions for you, without your full understanding of what is happening or why. As I stated at the beginning of this video, I understand the sense of hesitancy regarding vaccines. All I hope is that you also take a look at some of the scientific literature that I have presented here, as well as the other papers that you can find for yourself. At the same time, I hope that you understand where I am coming from. For way too many times in recent years, I have seen stories of someone who refused to get a vaccine before they were hospitalized, where they expressed their regret of not getting vaccinated and later ended up dying from COVID. To my viewers who agree with me on vaccines, please don't make the mistake of seeing this as some kind of ironic karma, which sadly has been a reaction from some people on the pro-vaccine side. No, please don't do this. They are tragic victims of the very anti-vaccine misinformation that is putting all of us at risk. So, in summary, all current scientific evidence that we have points to the conclusion that vaccines are safe, they prevent diseases like measles, and have even eradicated others like polio. There is no evidence vaccines cause autism or sudden deaths, 
and there is no evidence that cell phone radio waves cause cancer, and millions of lives have been objectively improved by the introduction of vaccines. I'll tell you something personal. I hate needles. I can't stand to watch an injection, but I get my flu shot anyway. I get it not only because it protects me, but it also protects other people around me. I got the COVID-19 vaccine as soon as it was available too. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.